Hi guys. Uh, okay, this is working. All right, so uh, my name is Mike Murray, and I'm from Bemidji State University in uh, Bemidji, Minnesota. And uh, it is a lot warmer here than it is there. My, uh, my wife said it was 30 below Celsius there the other day, so uh, it's nicer here. Anyway, uh, uh, my talk uh, today is uh, entitled The Regional Job Guarantee. And uh, I, uh, so I, I actually come from uh, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, uh, where, it's where, I gra well, where it's where I graduated from. So uh, I come from the kind of the school of thought of, uh, of the, uh, I came from out of CFAPS, the Center for Full Employment Price Stability, which is the American variant of coffee here, here in Australia. So uh, I had, uh, my dissertation advice was Matt Forstetter. I actually had Stephanie Kelton for like four or five classes. So uh, I'm very much come out of that uh, school of thought. But uh, 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 Matt Forstetter, as my advisor, I don't know if you've ever read a lot of his work, but uh, uh, he takes a classical political, yeah, shut up. Uh, he takes a classical political economy perspective of, of uh, everything, really. So, uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think we need to start thinking about the Green New Deal and uh, the job guarantee and public sector employment within a classical political economy perspective. Uh, and I wrote a bunch of notes on that last night because it's been kind of frustrating me. I think, I think we really need to uh, start from uh, Marx as our origin rather than uh, 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 looking at uh, even before we get to Keynes, right? But uh, anyway. Uh, I think we need a new foundational background to look at uh, uh, the, the Green New Deal policies and, and, uh, and the job guarantee and how that all fits in there and public sector employment more generally and looking at uh, the difference between uh, the public sector where the public sector uh, should focus on uh, 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 what's valuable to society, right? And whereas the private sector, right, they're, they're, they're focused on they're making their own profits and pecu pecuniary gain and things like that, right? And since the, 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 these two entities come from, different come from different starting points, right? They have different objectives. The public sector is uh, welfare maximizing. The private sector is, uh, is profit maximizing. And you can see all this stuff in Marx, because in, in, Marx's whole thing when he talks about the uh, 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 extraction of surplus value by the capitalist class, right? Well, that's essentially the private sector trying to, you know, generate profits for themselves, right? They need to extract that surplus value, and then they need to, uh, and then they need to realize that surplus value through, uh, uh, through uh, selling it for money, right? Where money becomes a realization of that surplus value. Anyway, uh, uh, no one's been talking about this stuff uh, at, at, at uh, this conference yet, and I think we need to uh, uh, start at a different foundational, uh, a different foundation for, for analysis of the, of the Green New Deal, and, uh, and, and start for Marx, and then, and then uh, bring in Kaletsky and Keynes after that, and, uh, and then we need uh, appropriate modeling, which is also a, which is also uh, in Marx and, uh, and also Keynes, the Cambridge Keynesians. And, and honestly, I think uh, uh, we need to, right, because how, how does, how, does uh, how, did, how, how did we get to where we are? Well, we got to where we are because uh, you had the neoliberal school start in whatever, the 1970s, 1980s, but that came from all of a bunch of, a, of foundational theory from the 1950s, right? And, and, and right, so the Chicago School of Economists and so on and so forth, uh, you know, did all this stuff in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So when Thatcher and Reagan came on board in the 80s, they had this nice, like, foundational theory to set up upon. Well, I think we really need to do that for the Green New Deal because we're in, we're, 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 we're in, a, we're in a transition, right? And, and we need to, uh, uh, this, 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 uh, uh, the, this like third industrial revolution, as uh, Jeffrey R R R Rinkin, what's his last name? Rifkin. Jeremy, thank you. Rifkin, Jeremy Rifkin, right, as he calls it, right? It's going to require a different uh, uh, foundational uh, background. So anyway, uh, it's just something I've been thinking about the last few days, and uh, it has nothing to do with 
Well, that's somewhat what I was going to do. I was going to talk about, but I'll go pretty quick here now. Uh, I think, I th and I'll skip over a bunch of stuff since I already did that spiel. Um, uh, uh, so I think uh, Wendy Harcourt came to Kansas City in 2008, uh, gave, gave a fabulous keynote. Yes, and it's uh, Dr. Harcourt's daughter. <laughs> Who does she and she does great work, um, uh, and she says uh, uh, her issue, uh, her view of sustainable human development is development that doesn't merely generate growth but distributes its benefits equitably. It regenerates the environment rather than destroys it. It empowers people rather than marginalizing them. It enlarges their choices and opportunities and provides for people's participation in decisions affecting their lives. Sustainable human development is development that is pro-poor, pro-nature, pro-women. It stresses growth, but growth with employment, growth with environment, growth with empowerment, and growth with equity. So I think this, right, this is a good, the public sector needs to value these things, right? This is welfare enhancing. The private sector, by definition, is, it, it, it's for their own pecuniary interests, right? The purpose of Apple is to make cool iPhones, right? And they come out and they come out with a new iPhone like every year because they want to make profits. But it's Apple's job to make profits for themselves and their shareholders, right? It's not Apple's job to take care of all this, and we shouldn't ask the private sector to take care of all this. We need to we need to mandate that the public sector uh, uh, start valuing this stuff, and it it, it it causes us as a society to then uh, redefine what should be public goods, right? Should education be a public good? Well, I would argue yes, it should be, right? Well, at the very minimum, is is the right to survive given a climate change crisis a public good, right? Well, I believe it should be, right? We should all be, right? So, so like. Like, if we can agree on a set of facts, like, like this is our baseline, right? Every, everybody, uh, regardless of their socioeconomic status, is, uh, these are natural human rights, right? Education, housing, income, whatever, right? Come up, come up with a given start, uh, uh, a starting point that we can, we can all agree on, because they, and then we can debate about how we should uh, get, get it done um, later on. So anyway, uh, I... Uh, i uh, like to look at uh, the job guarantee, and this was only supposed to be about the job guarantee, but it kind of went off a little bit. Anyway, uh, I like to look at it from, uh, uh, whoop, whoop. I like to look at it from an uh, uh, economic democracy perspective. And uh, here are the tenets for uh, economic democracy, encouraging local governance and uh, things like that. Uh, I'm going to, I, I can send Steve my slides and he can uh, send it to you guys. I want to give other people uh, more time too. So, so the job guarantee basically says that, okay, uh, and Pavlina Chernova has a great paper on the Levy Economics <laughs> website on, uh, on the job guarantee, and, uh, and it says that we're going to have these community job banks, we're going to work with, uh, with uh, the nonprofit sector, and I would argue even work with the private sector, because right, if the goal, like Bill Mitchell said, is to transition back to the private sector for these, public se for these job guarantee jobs, well then we need, to work, we need to ask the private sector, what skills do you need these people to have, right? So they're stakeholders too. I also would argue that we need to elevate the interests of marginalized groups, right? Because they need to be part of this discussion too, because they're very important stakeholders. And who is left out of that process? It is the marginalized groups every time, right? Every time. In my, I read in the newspaper uh, a couple of days ago, my local newspaper in Bemidji, uh, they were, uh, there was a, a discussion at our local, uh, the local city hall on uh, uh, whether or not to bring in refugees, uh, uh, a handful of refugees uh, into our city. We have a small city, 15,000. Do you know who is not at the table? The refugees, right? Like, <laughs> right? And, 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 and who's not at the table, uh, right? Who's not in this room? The unemployed, right? We have a bunch of people, probably with jobs, right? Talking about how to, uh, you know, right? Help people. Uh, uh, that, 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 that are worse off from us. The other day, uh, when, when uh, uh, I forgot who it was, but they asked, you know, who uh, doesn't have a mortgage, sit down, right? And then most of you guys actually were still standing up, right? So, like, we have to understand that we are the privileged class, right? And, 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 and we need to, uh, uh, we, 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 just like white privilege, right? We need to recognize class privilege, right? And, and then, <laughs> right? So, 
right? So, and, then, and, 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 and after we recognize class privilege, we have to say, okay, what can we do to elevate uh, these, these, these marginalized groups so they're part of the discussion? Now I'm gonna go very, uh, to the, oh, by the way, very quick, and I'll be two more minutes. Modern money theory, I'm not gonna talk about it because we've talked about it for the last three days, but in two, I think it's very interesting, and this is in David Harvey's uh, book, uh, Marx and the Madness of Economic Reason. Fantastic book, everybody should buy it, it's awesome. Anyway, uh, he says uh, in t over 2007, 2008, after the financial crisis, uh, the US literally printed $16 trillion to bail out the, the financial sector. In 2007, China had zero, Kill, uh, I guess you'd use kilometers, kilometers of high-speed rail, zero. And then in, uh, in, in uh, what is this, at the same time, uh, I forgot how many miles, but they also absor absorbed uh, 17 million people into that process to build infrastructure, right? 17 million people, they, they right? So China took the financial crisis and decided to employ people and build infrastructure, right? The U.S., uh, what they did with the money was they just bailed out the rich people, right? And now look at China. Look, that's the high-speed rail. That's the high-speed rail network in the last 10 years. I just came from Shanghai, and I'm going back at 7.30 today. It is amazing what they're doing over there, right? It is um, the model... The model that the Chinese are doing is literally amazing, right? And also, Shanghai is the cleanest city, the cleanest big city I've ever been in, ever. They have workers that will sweep the, that, that sweep the streets, and Shanghai is clean by 9 a.m. It is amazing. So anyway, uh, uh, we need, we need uh, economic democracy, we need participation and ownership, uh, and we need to define who the stakeholders are, Right? That's a very important, important part of the process. And then we need to engage in citizen participation uh, that will then uh, redistribute power away from those groups that already have all the power to the marginalized groups and there's stuff on that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, this is all. Uh, so uh, for, those of, for those of you who are interested, uh, this, I could send anyone uh, the slides and also the paper. Now, this is coming out in a book called uh, uh, The Algo Companion to Modern Money Theory. Uh, and uh, it should be out, I don't know, sometime this year. All right, anyway, that's all I got. It's called The Algo Companion to uh, Ma Algar, E L G A R. Yeah, Algar. Uh, it's called Marx and the Madness of Economic Reason, and it was uh, published in 2018, 17, something like that. They ran out of the fancy lapel mics, so <laughs> I have to do this manually. Thank you, Ali. Um, uh, I put together a presentation for this. Obviously, one of the great things about coming to a conference like this is that there is a lot of overlap in the ideas that people are talking about. Uh, and, and my presentation is, is no different to that. So I'm going to skip through the first couple of sections quite quickly. Um, but obviously, if, if people do have questions about any of the thoughts, happy to talk about it. My name's Ed. I, I am the Economic and Climate Justice Director at GetUp, um, and we've been doing a lot of work after the election. Yeah, thank you. Chuck your hand up if you are a GetUp member. Hey, look at that. <laughs> Um, and it's been, it's been great to be here this week, and at the moment well, I'm also sort of working on coordinating GetUp's bushfire response, which has been really hard, and a lot of, um, a lot of our members are personally affected by, by bushfires. I mean, I think all of us have been affected by the fires, um, either personally or someone that we know or, or you know, caught in the smoke and haze in, in big cities, and it's sort of uh, against that backdrop that I think conversations like this and, and meetings like this are incredibly important, um, not just because they provide a, a sense of a path forward, but also because they're a really important coming together moment for those of us who are really worried about the future 
um, for ourselves, our kids, our grandkids, and and you know the environment and wildlife um, that have had you know tremendous uh, consequences over the last couple of months. So I want to talk a little bit about where we are and, and where we're going, um, not just in terms of, of GetUp, but also I think thinking about some of the practical ways in which, oops, the um, organizing and, can you make that full screen again? Uh, or organizing and kind of climate efforts across the country are sort of starting to pivot out of the election and, and into what's next. Um, and I think that the, the broad consensus is, is that we're a bit fucked right now, um, uh, that we are in a really bad shape in terms of meeting our international global emissions reductions targets in a way that would keep us under 1.5 percent warming um, uh, and that it's not just climate change that's the problem it's it's you know as people have talked about at this conference a, a whole host of interconnected con uh, you know uh, challenges that have capitalism and colonialism and extractionism at, at the sort of core of, of, of that problem um, uh, and for some people, it's, it's already too late. Like We're seeing the consequences of climate change in our day-to-day -day lives play out, um, uh, much in the same way that we're already seeing the consequences of poverty and a welfare system that's woefully inadequate play out for um, working class people and unemployed people across the country. Um, uh, and it's pretty clear that the, the market isn't going to solve this problem. Um, I mean, we don't need to engage in particularly complex economic theory to, to know that. You just have to look at a graph and see that, you know, it's not going to move on its own. And if, if we are going to kind of solve this problem, we need to do it together. Um, uh, and, that, and that this is a time for being um, strategic because I am really worried about um, the way that conservatives might respond to the climate emergency that we're in, not to fix the problem, but to weaponize that problem against marginalized and oppressed communities in the ways that they've done historically. And, and that means that solidarity, community, and a clear strategy for um, coming together and organizing together is really, really important. Um, and I, I think that one of the final things about you know, the, the context that we're in is that if, if we were uh, you know, winning, I think that we would know about it. Um, I, I think regularly about the fact that when Kevin Rudd proposed a, you know, a tax that the mining lobby didn't like, they announced that they were spending $100 million to get rid of him. Uh, and they succeeded. And, and we haven't seen that kind of coordinated large-scale action happening um, from our opponents um, just yet. And, and I think that you know, th there's still a good way to go in terms of the fight that we need to have. Um, one of the things that makes this situation even slightly more grim, and I, I swear it's going to get hopeful in a second, um, uh, is that our political system is, is in some ways fragile right now and, and not necessarily equipped to deal with the crisis that we have. Um, you know, there are a couple of strategic weaknesses, a reactionary media cycle, uh, a short-term short -term electoral cycles, um, a compulsory voting system that tends to drive parties towards the center in the way that they kind of campaign and, and de develop political platforms. Um, and that a lot of the time, the internal democracy within our parties or institutional democratic structures aren't all that democratic in a way that makes it very hard for someone like an AOC to come through and blow that system wide open. Um, uh, and you know, I think that conservatives are taking advantage of that. Um, they're running really effective scare campaigns. They have very little in the way of an attachment to the truth. Um, uh, and that those things, uh, unfortunately, in the age of digital media and collapsing trust in journalistic institutions, are working. Um, you know, during the election, we saw that the death tax, you know, became uh, one of the most prominently searched things towards the, in the final days of the election because of a coordinated, centralized misinformation campaign. Um, and also, you know, we've got billionaires flooding the system with money, uh, and we should probably do something about that. Um, and, and that's a real problem for progressives, because I think that, you know, a lot of the, what, what we've been talking about at this conference is how do we create a vision for a state that's bolder and, and more um, progressive in the way that it solves the problems. But, but in, in reality, what we're seeing is that, is that people are, are losing faith in that system because of the forces that are pulling it further and further away from local grassroots organizing and, and, and perspectives. Um, and let's be frank, we might have some blame on the left uh, in, in the way that we think about that as well. 
Um, and I don't say that to, to be confrontational. I just say that to, because I think that it's really important that when we think about the politics that we're in right now, um, what we need to understand is that there, there is a real sense in which if you want to genuinely reach out to the communities that we need to re-engage in politics, we probably need to have a very careful think about the way that we do that. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that in a second, but here's the first glimmer of hope. Climate voters are here. We, we saw that and we've done a lot of research post-election about how people voted and why people voted. Um, and more people voted on climate in the most recent election than any prior election. Climate was the number one ranked issue uh, for swing voters that changed their vote from Liberal to Labor. Uh, and it's the number one concern amongst the Labor Party uh, voters and members themselves. Um, and so this issue is not going away in our politics. It's going to get better and better and better. And the constituency for climate action and progressive change is going to get bigger and bigger as well. And we need to be able to harness that moment. We need to be ready for that moment um, where that constituency doesn't just become a big swing, but it becomes a decisive swing. And we need to understand what that swing is for and have a clear vision that we can articulate for what climate action means to us as a community. And that's what I want to talk about now, um, which is I think that we need to figure out a way of building a path forward together. I think that, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of conversations happening around the country right now about um, what a Green New Deal might look like or, or what the right kind of solution to um, the electoral, uh, you know, result that we just had was. One of the things that I think is really important for us to understand is that this room is not representative of the nation in which we live. And I mean, you can tell that just by looking around. Um, uh, or the exercise yesterday where I think it was like 90% of you own your homes. You bastards. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, and I, I, you know, I think I think that in that context, what we need is to create mechanisms and forums and frameworks, um, not to just put forward a policy agenda that is that we that we require people to sign on to or, or, or sign off against, but to include them in the process of, of writing that policy agenda and co-creating that policy agenda, because the Green New Deal is not just a set of policies. The Green New Deal is, 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 is and should be a process of engaging with one another across more diverse constituencies than we have before. Um, it's about co-creating a story of how we got to where we are in the crisis that we face and co-creating a compelling vision that people can see themselves in regardless of whether they're a coal worker in the Hunter Valley or uh, you know, someone in Warringah who thinks that climate action is more important than a budget surplus. Um, and I think that what that process is going to need to do is meaningfully engage with the affected communities themselves. And in particular, what, that, what I think that means is having a chat to the unions, having a chat to uh, frontline indigenous communities, uh, and I'm, by that I mean all of them, uh, you know, activists and traditional owners, people who, whose land this belongs to still. Um, uh, but also having a think, to, a think about all the diverse industries that, that need to be a part of um, creating that process. Um, we also obviously need research and we need a kind of strategic framework that ties the movement together. Um, and I think that, you know, there are a couple of different ways of doing that that are being discussed. There's, there's already a lot of, um, you know, a process that, that's sort of bringing together some of the biggest unions in the country with the biggest climate organizations in the country and some of the biggest universities in the country um, to co-create a process for how we do this. One suggestion um, that we're working on throughout the course of, of 2020 and, and GetUp's playing a role in helping facilitate is, is a process called transformational scenario planning, which is a wanky kind of phrase, but um, it was used in post-apartheid South Africa to bring together incredibly conflicting groups, people who did not agree with each other at all about what the future of that country should or could look like, um, to co-create possible futures or an understanding of possible futures, not as a proposal for where we head or as a forecast of what will happen, but as an understanding that there are different ways that this could end up. Um, and that if we work together in certain ways, we might end up in one place. And if we work together in others or fail to work together at all, we might end up in, else, in, in other places. And by building a container of trust in which those conversations can take place um, with a broad number of people, um, you begin to develop understandings of what 
might be unacceptable to all of us uh, in a way that propels us towards the future that we might share together. And so I think that you know one of the things that, that I, I, I feel pretty strongly about the Green New Deal and Green New Deal politics is that rather than coming with a, a set of proposals or policies, the thing that we need to do is agree on the process first. We need to have a process in place for First Nations consultation, and that will take time. Uh, I mean, there are so many different indigenous nations around the country, and we should be including as many of them as possible. That could take a year. Um, you know, we need to be doing the consultation work across the movement to build the vehicle for change. We need to be having a chat, not just to this room, but to rooms like this all across the country um, in order to bring as many people into the conversation around what policy might look like and what policies matter most to people. Um, and we need to build campaigns that speak to people on local grassroots individual levels in the communities in which they live and tie that big vision to the challenges that they're facing in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and there's already a lot of organizations out there doing this amazing work, so we need to tie those people together as well rather than sort of um, you know, come in over the top um, as GetUp or as, as anyone else um, to, to, to sort of uh, you know, make that happen. So you know, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that one of the things that's happened post-election is that people are thinking about ways of doing things differently. And in the same way that in the aftermath of 2016, I was, when Trump got elected, <laughs> I was so despairing that I quit my job and started, you know, working at GetUp and, and was sort of like, you know, the, the arc of the moral universe does not seem to be bending towards justice right now. But what we've seen happen in that country is a massive acceleration on the left towards genuine progressive organizing, campaigning and movement building that in some ways we might just yet, uh, you know, the 2016 election might just have been the best thing to happen to us. Um, that's my hope. <laughs> No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, I'm Jane Flanagan. I have. Um, I'm not an economist. I'm a occupational therapist, and um, really probably can be counted among the many insufferable MMT enthusiasts in the room. So I really have come to this um, journey through, um, you know, a, well. In actual fact, I am related to Bill Mitchell's wife. I'm her first cousin, so I don't know how, <laughs> how I would have come to MMT if I hadn't have um, had Bill as a family member because I think, um, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't have come across it unless, until maybe the Future to Fight For <laughs> campaign because I was, you know, a Get Up member for, I, and still am a Get, get Up member and it's an excellent campaign. So... Um, yeah, I have been lucky in that way and ever since really it has changed the path on which I've, you know, taken professionally, personally. And um, so uh, having been an occupational therapist in aged care, I um, have seen, you know, I've, you know, ever since I've worked in the system, it's been under-resourced and um, understaffed and caseloads that have been unmanageable and essential resources, you know, not available, you know, they've been scarce. Um, you know, as an occupational therapist, we prescribe things like pressure care, which are, you know, life or death, really, in a lot of circumstances. And these have been scarce, you know, you're waiting weeks sometimes to get these pieces of equipment out to people. I had a um, client who, um, when I was working at MS Australia, who wait, was told he needed to wait three years to be assessed to get a wheelchair, who was going through an acute episode of um, uh, his MS and couldn't walk. And this was in a major city in Australia, in Sydney. <laughs> Happened to be in one of the more impoverished areas of Sydney, which is Parramatta, the Parramatta local government area. Um, so a lot of our time as um, clinical, as clinicians really are about, you know, fighting for the resources that um, are, should be available. And um, because our patients don't have those, advocacy, you know, they just don't have those advocacy skills. So um, I have experienced firsthand, really, the you know terrible situation in which our health system is in. And um, 
I am sick of constantly hearing um, politicians talking about the burden of our ageing population and we've only just heard Josh Frydenberg talking about the economic time bomb that is the aged and um, you know it just is shameful and appalling that we talk in these terms because it you know our aging population are a triumph and we should be you know supporting them as well as we can and you know as you would have heard maybe um, Phil Lorne has done an excellent video on the debunking the aging myths and it's one of my favorite absolutely favorite MMT videos and how he explains um, which we've heard over the last few days the government can't run out of money we can afford to um, pay for nice things like aged care and education and infrastructure and housing, all of these things that are um, fundamental to our health. Um, and so, you know, I think I've since shifted from a clinical focus. I'm still working as an occupational therapist, but I now um, am doing a Master's of Public Health and um, with, you know, with a view to um, sort of, I think I told Stephen how about a year ago, I'm determined to shift the conversation within the public health community. So um, I'm now um, part of the political economy of health special interest group on their committee and um, slowly chipping away at what is still, you know, they're still dictated by the orthodoxy. So they're still talking about, you know, getting money off the rich people before we can afford um, the things that we need in healthcare. But I think more so um, now, I think my focus has shifted because it's now um, thinking about, you know, health in all policies. We, you know, our health isn't just determined by our access to a hospital or access to um, community services. It's determined by whether or not we have um, access to good education, uh, good transport and housing. All of these factors influence your health across the lifespan. And if you start off in poverty, you are likely to have a shorter lifespan. So um, these, um, yeah, it's extremely important and it's, it is a life and death matter and health um, is impacted by what happens on a macro level, our everyday health, our everyday wellbeing. Um, so um, I, um, Let's see, <laughs> I made notes, but uh, my, um, my focus now is really about um, broadening the conversation and promoting modern monetary theory as a basis of improving our democracy and improving equality and um, you know, ensuring that everyone has equal access, equal rights to health, you know, improving health equity in Australia. Uh, and I um, really, it is against my grain. I mean, I'm shaking in my boots right now and it's not something that I would usually do, but I really, if I can do it, you know, we all can do it. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I think we just have to be bold and we have to be vigilant because, you know, our healthcare system is being privatised by stealth um, you know, our aged care reform system now is, is now a market model. Our um, NDIS is a, it's a market model and it's completely unfair and inequitable. And, um, and the workers within that system are also facing, you know, a lot of hardship because it's become, become casualised. So I'm now part of a gig economy in the health sector. So um, uh, I... Now I'm um, looking at, you know, I'm part of Modern Money Australia, which I um, have co-founded with several members. And I think once we've finished discussing here, we're, I'm just going to call them down and we, I hope it's okay, but we're just going to give you a brief rundown of what we're doing and maybe um, if you would like to join in, we're going to try to est establish groups across Australia. Um, and I just think, you know, as Bill said, it's an ed educative approach, I suppose. We need to um, really be able to 
empower ourselves with that knowledge to then be able to empower everyone else in, um, and to then be able to challenge the lies that um, our politicians tell us because we know we can have nice things. We've got a, you know, a huge, um, it's a huge challenge ahead of us and I'm frightened and, you know, but MMT, uh, I think, is hopeful. It is what gives me hope anyway, but I know that it's a, a big challenge to try and shift the conversation. Anyway, so I'll leave it at that. And um, <laughs> okay. Um, oh, can everyone? Yeah, fantastic. Um, so uh, my name's uh, Lachlan McCall. I'm an economist uh, and a public sector ac uh, union activist. Um, I'll be talking in a moment at the um, in the trades union panel. I'll, I'll try not to repeat uh, too many points, but I wanted to sort of uh, echo the comments that have been made by my um, three co-panelists. Uh, in particular, I think I, I really want to um, emphasise. Um, uh, I really sort of want to emphasise what um, Ed was saying about the importance of how we have these conversations um, out there in the community. Um, I'm conscious that, and I want to uh, emphasise something. Another point that Ed made, uh, this is, uh, and we'll return to this point in the unions panel as well, um, this, is a, this, this is a very um, white collar audience. I'm, I'm as, about as white collar as they get. I don't know, uh, I, I, the, the phrase Chardonnay, you know, the Chardonnay socialist label may as well have just been um, invented for me. I'm essentially, <laughs> I don't, I, 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 it's, it's, um, I'm, I'm about as far away from, from um, the blue collar um, working <laughs> class as you can get. And yet one of the things that um, I've learned over a number, a number of years is that we primarily as um, upper middle class white collar um, activists, uh, as people in particular in the tertiary sectors of the economy, we have not been particularly good at going out and listening to the communities who are on the front line of the climate crisis. And the people... Um, and, and Bill sort of uh, alluded to this in his talk uh, yesterday. Um, if anyone has uh, uh, come across the MMT podcast, which is fantastic, by the way, um, there's an episode... Um, which is just a recording of Bill's speech at the UK Labour Conference uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and it's absolutely fantastic. And, and, and um, uh, Michael alluded to um, the issue of class privilege. And I think that's, that's, that, is a, that is a critical issue because we cannot go into blue-collar communities that have been, as I'll say in the unions panel in a second, they've essentially been gaslighted or gaslit by neoliberalism. I mean, neoliberalism is a form of economic gaslighting. We deliberately create a pool of unemployed workers to suppress wages and inflation. We then blame, well, we, but neoliberalism then blames workers for what has been done to them. And all too often then as environmental activists, we then go into these communities and have the, or the, 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 the disgraceful gall to belittle and denigrate and deride people for having the sheer audacity to seek to escape the poverty and misery of unemployment. Um, and, and, and then we wonder why they voted against us. Um, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm personally am, am on, on board with the, the aims of, of, say, Stop Adani, and I don't want to uh, offend anyone here in what I'm about to say, and I'm not saying it, again, to be confrontational. I do wish the message had been start the Green New Deal rather than Stop Adani. And I say that as someone who doesn't want the Adani coal mine built. But I much rather, I would have much preferred it if we had had a convoy going into regional Queensland, into Rockhampton, saying, listen, what's been done to you is an atrocity. The fact, we know if there was a, a, a paper that came out in the uh, uh, Australian and New Zealand uh, Journal of Psychiatry from 2015 that said, unemployed men are 4.6 times more likely to take their own lives than employed men. You know, what's been done to working people in Australia in the neoliberal era is criminal. And, and to the, 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 the vital, to get to the, the, the core of the political economy of the Green New Deal, we have a twin crisis here. 
the climate crisis and the employment crisis. And both are killing workers. Both of them are killing workers. And to construct any uh, environmental narrative or environmental agenda that lectures at workers rather than listening to workers and letting them drive and lead their own, essentially to, at the risk of being a bit wanky, but to lead their own emancipation from this crisis. Um, the idea that, uh, and we, we saw a lot of it after the election. We heard people talking about Quexit. Fuck that, sorry. <laughs> the, 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 the narrative that, that, that blue collar workers in regional Queensland don't know what's good for them and they have to be told what's good for them by us. That is, a, Michael used the term class privilege earlier and, we, and we've, if, if we're going to have any success whatsoever in saving ourselves from an existential threat, then that has to be the starting point, is starting by, uh, starting by essentially uh, being aware of and questioning our own um, assumptions and class privilege. The working class knows what's in their interests. They weren't you know, seduced by Murdoch or you know, this, the, the belittling narrative that suggests that somehow uh, uh, blue collar workers somehow don't know what's in their own best interests, as opposed to an honest reflection that would say perhaps the way we approached that, or the, perhaps sometimes the way we've approached these things has, hasn't been particularly inclusive. Or perhaps, as Bill, says in his, as Bill Mitchell says in his talk to the UK um, Labour Party, and he mentioned, he alluded to it yesterday, you know, what are the optics of uh, upper middle class, white collar cosmopolitan people like myself? I mean, as I said, I alluded to earlier, the, the entire Chardonnay industry in this country is propped up by me. <laughs> uh, but the idea of going into regional communities um, and essentially saying that we're just going to stop this, we're going to stop production of this and then we go home. What do these communities who have been destroyed by neoliberalism and high regional unemployment, what are, they, what, what are they going to do? How else are they going to react? And the, the thing that I think is quite inspiring about the Green New Deal, whether you call it a green transition, um, some people want to suggest the phrase uh, the, the Green Accord, all sorts of uh, language, whatever, I, I don't know what exactly the correct terminology is. But a strategy, green, call it green industry policy, if you will. Actually, the, the Andrews government in Victoria I think might have, uh, is, is close to, I think, nailing the correct kind of framing for this. Um, most of the Victorian government's climate policy is done under the guise of industry policy because the environmental vote's already there. They're already being spoken to, but it's people in the outer western suburbs of Melbourne who need to have the, the, the link between their interests and, and uh, climate change action uh, drawn. So what does the Andrews government do? They h trumpet the fact that they are opening an old, formerly shuttered Ford factory in Geelong. They're reopening it as a factory for wind turbines. And that's, that's blue collar industry policy. But it's actually climate policy. It's climate policy under the guise of industry policy. And as a result, a whole section of the population that, that have been uh, persuaded by elements of the Murdoch press and others to view climate change as the concern for people who are rich enough to, be, to, to afford to be concerned by it. Which of course, I, I do think the events of this summer are beginning to shatter that narrative. As the, 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 the crisis, the tragedy that's happening in our country, I think is beginning to break that narrative. But it is still a very deeply entrenched one, that environmentalism and climate action are things for people who can afford to worry about them. And smashing that narrative is absolutely crucial. We, we, we can't, we, we are not going to be able to save ourselves and save the planet if we can't do that. Um, and so that does involve, for instance, um, valuing manufacturing and respecting manufacturing workers. It involves engaging with blue collar workers. As we'll say in the, um, the, the unions panel, it, it's not just a political necessity, it's an, it's an economic and industrial necessity. We are not going to we're not going to decarbonise without building a lot of batteries, solar panels and wind turbines. Who's going to dig up the iron ore to build the wind turbines? Who is going to make the steel? Who is going to create the hydrogen-fired steel making industry to replace a metallurgical coal-fired steel industry? Who's going to dig up the rare earths and minerals we need to make the batteries? Who's going to then manufacture the batteries? And it's not going to be my class. I don't know how to do that. I don't have the <laughs> skills to do that. 
I did political economy. I would just, just stand there next to a, a, a pile of raw materials and just talk about Sraffer and Marx at it. Like, it's, uh, you know. And who are, the, who are the people who've got the skills and the abilities to actually put this thing together? It's the people who for, all too, for far too long have been spoken at, lectured at, denigrated for taking jobs in uh, extractive industries just because that is what neoliberalism has forced them to do. Because neoliberalism has deliberately ensured that there are fewer jobs than there are workers who need them. Because that's our, as, as Bill brilliantly says, um, that's been essentially our, counter our counterinflationary policy. Is, is deliberate poverty and unemployment, which is overwhelmingly concentrated in the outer suburbs and the regions. It's overwhelmingly concentrated among uh, people with less educational privilege. It's overwhelmingly concentrated among the working class. And so, uh, with it, wherever you, whatever you stand on the job guarantee, I happen to think the job guarantee is one of the most brilliant, elegant, uh, uh, really beautiful sort of uh, uh, bits of public policy design and, and, and thinking um, I've come across. I think it's just genius. Um, whatever your stance on it, the political economy, economy of full employment as the main charge against climate change has got to be vital. Uh, because these are policies, these are ideas that first and foremost are going to create jobs in the outer suburbs, first and foremost create blue collar jobs in the regions. And if we can't make, if we can't get that one right, if we can't lead the charge against regional and rural unemployment and say this is literally how we stop the climate crisis, if we can't marry those two together, um, when it's, it, it, I would say it would be a fairly sort of intuitive thing. If we can't get that right, we, 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 we're going to simply fail. So. So I'll just, 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 just quickly, I'll just quickly finish by saying um, our personal responsibility, I think, as environmental activists is when we see um, conservative voters, not conservative politicians, but conservative voters um, and voters, swing voters, particularly um, in the kinds of uh, places that swung against the Greens and against Labor uh, last May, when we see people sort of uh, you know, saying things uh, online that we, we don't agree with, that are conservative, da, 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 